My grandfather landed in the Philippines one year after the Spanish-American War, where Admiral Dewey annihilated the Spanish fleet in Manila. That was in 18, May of 19, 1898. And he landed there as Corporal of the Illinois Volunteers. In 1902, like I think some 18,000 American soldiers decided to discharge in Manila. And it was a colonial, it was a colony of the United States. And they tried their luck there, and a lot of them stayed there. And, and Papa, like I called him, became, I think, the first sheriff of the city of Manila appointed by the American government. And like your GIs are training Afghans, he was training Filipinos to be policemen. And I, after the First World War, he joined the Philippine Trust Company and died as vice president, which was owned by the Georgetown American Friars that was sold to the Filipinos in 1947. And he was the only American who stayed till he died in 59. Every Sunday our chauffeur would drive us. I used to love to watch the American forces with their Springfields in formation on what Saturdays or Sunday? In Intramuros, Manila, there were thousands of young GIs there. And you wouldn't believe this, their, 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 their BDUs, their fatigues in World War II, the American forces used blues jeans. Did you know that? No. Yeah. That was my pastime, so I was like born with the Army. Oh, in the Army-Navy club where on Sundays uh, Papa used to take me there, I'd have a beautiful club uh, for U.S. citizens. He was very old then, but I used to go with him and, and that's where I saw MacArthur and them guys, they were all in white clothes. Uh, the, the, their speech, what they talked about at home and the radio and and Pearl Harbor, we knew it was all over with, on the radios, you know. And uh, but at that age, you know, you say, well, why? You know, I mean, I knew that's when I saw those planes the next day, and and I'll never forget they they came above us, and then they diverted to the different bases. And they hit it one time. We lost our air force in Clark. That's 50 miles away, and that's uh, uh, and the American soldiers with their old. British helmets they had. They didn't have the helmet. They were breaking down the Japanese stores and arresting all the Japanese. That didn't last long. From December 8th, January 8th, the Japanese were in. MacArthur declared the city open city, and he retreated to Bataan and Corregidor. But they were all crying. Everybody was crying. My grandmother and, and my grandfather, Papa, was sitting down. And But they already knew something was coming months before, but uh, they didn't know it was... and. We didn't know when we were going to hit, be hit next. I didn't care. I was too young, you know. I mean, I said, "Why is everybody so solemn?" It was really solemn. Uh, that's when those planes came and, and hit us. And and right up about first week of January, there was, I was at Paco Catholic School. They give, is, issued a lot of Japanese flags, and all the school school kids were told to go to Taft Avenue. And these tanks came in with all the Japanese troops in the parade, and we were all waving, welcome, 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 like that. Uh, yeah, we were told to do that. I was with my uncle and my mother, and um, we got in the car, we went. It's not, it wasn't affecting us. The, the bombing was outside the city, but it, Nielsen, Nichols, Sangley Point Cavite was within sight of the bay. It was a submarine base, and my uncle was chief engineer there for the Navy, civilian. And, uh, the older people were panicking. I was getting a big kick out of it. But to me, all that rumbling was nothing but a lot of fun, you know. And we had our photographs taken, uh, you know, First Holy Communion. And I went home and everybody was crying and it hit us the next day and there was a lot of neighbors gathering together and uh, they knew that the Japs, they, they heard too that the Japs had landed in the very same spot MacArthur landed when he came back to the Philippines. He made two landings, which is another story then. When they picked up my grandfather, he rubbed my head and he had a little satchel. I guess he had already a note that he was going to be uh, sent to prison. This, this Japanese officer, I knew him. He had a furniture shop in Manila. He came back a colonel. He bowed to my grand, Mr. McMahon. He said, I'm so sorry, he said, and even led my grandfather down the steps and they pulled him up the truck. There were American soldiers already captive and Filipinos that were driving the trucks. 
there were American trucks and American soldiers and Filipino soldiers already prisoners that were helping the Japanese uh, pick up civilians. Early February, my, my brother was put on a ship and sent to Mindanao. The next big, we had a big coconut plantation there. That's what your ivory saw was made out of. And uh, my aunt was there, Edith, and she was living. And I didn't see my brother till the end of the war. He was in hiding. And me and my sister, she had a little red hair and I had little, we were sent to a, about 50 miles away to a town called La Cabuyao. And we were sent to a, a, a Dinulo's family, Filipino. And we were there for many months and then they had to turn us in because the Jats were threatening Filipinos uh, by full page ads. Dad left, I said goodbye to him on Pier 7 early December, right after Pearl Harbor. There were American ships on Pier 7 and uh, my aunt, his sister, took us to uh, the MV Doña Aniceta. He was, uh, he was purser and chief steward. And he had a black shirt and he was crying, went up the gangplank and they were painting big American flag on the both sides of the ship so the torpedoes wouldn't. And that's the last we saw of him. We saw the ship sail away and they were bound for here because the United States has confiscated all Allied ships to be used for the war. And they painted, they became American flags. They were flying Filipino flags then. And uh, we saw those ships leave, you know. I don't know, but they, I don't think they were torpedoed because Dad got here. My mother was, they were divorced. But they were good friends. You know. he, Dad, uh, Dad and Mom were, they were just young when they got married. And she was there. She went to that camp, Santo Tomas, but they separated the grown-ups from, I don't know when she went, I know when I went. First the Jap said, we have to report every week. And my uncle on the Spanish side would take me, we had no car, they confiscated our car. And we sit there all day long doing nothing. And about the third week they said, they have to stay. They had a plan for us. If you are eight and above, you work. So we planted vegetables for them. That's how I learned real gardening from the Japanese. And to tell you the truth, I saw no atrocities. I heard of some, not in that camp. I heard that some young girls were raped, but it seems that they were reprimanded and by their officers when they did that. But in the books, they say that there were a few cases of, uh, of uh, atrocities, you know, not murder, but beatings. Two guys tried to escape and they got punished. And uh, we stayed that whole year and had my job cut out for me. It tells you in that story that we helped the cooks, the Filipinos would leave firewood on the side of the, with, with, with their push carts, all the American kids would pick up the firewood, bring to the Japanese kitchens, which was nothing but a shack. With, and they cooked their rice, these cooks, in a G-string. That's the way they, yeah. Yeah, G-string. That's the way the Japanese, all over, they walk around like that. And they're singing, and, 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 and we got caught stealing some rice, and one of the cooks told us in the evening, don't steal, because if somebody else catches you, they'll, they'll you know, hurt you or spank you. He said, if you want some, we give you some. And American prisoners were not allowed to use plates. They give you sardine, empty sardine cans. Those are, those are your plates. They called my, they, everybody there is an uncle. This is a Filipino wealthy family with farms outside Manila and they felt that my sister and I would be safe there. And he just said something that he had to take us home to Manila, to my grandmother's house. So he took the car, his car took, 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 took us to my grandmother's house and when we got there my uncle said we have to go to Santo Tomas. Since we had no car, we had a dog car, like a horse buggy. They allowed us to keep that. So it's a long way. So. We get to Santo Tomas and you see a bunch of the mestizo, that's half half American, half Spanish, half something else. So I was half, we sit around all day and luckily we brought some goodies to eat, you know. But on that fourth or, third, fourth or fifth visit, they said we have to stay in the camp. They didn't even give us a chance to bring anything. So my uncle and this Japanese captain came back the next day to bring us, you know, soap and sugar. But you know, we shared that with the Japanese cooks because they, 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 were, they were not so well off. So every Sunday, 
They allowed Filipinos outside big, massive fence and massive gates, beautiful. They allowed them to bring food for American prisoners. And, um, and they can't go in, but boy, they'd hand out bananas and rice and we'd shove it up, you know, and the Japanese let us do that. But in late 43, just before they, did, they, they, they stopped that, I had three layers of, uh, they call it pecha. It's, uh, you have it here, bok choy. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. And other kids had, they didn't like tomatoes. They wanted anything they could pickle. And they'd take, take those and pickle them with salt and send them out to their troops. We couldn't eat them. But when Captain Kataoka would come every two weeks, maybe he was a young kid, maybe 22, Captain, he would bring a bucket with salted. He said, he said, I'm sorry, this is all I can bring. So we'd share a piece of salted pork or whatever it was, fish. And it was something different, you know, other than eating the same watered, rice, watered corn and rice every day. And, uh, but before I left that camp, when the Filipinos would bring those food, uh, food for us, all the Americans would share it with the Japanese. The Japanese were cut off from Japan. They, you live off the land. And we'd give some of our food to the cooks. They were okay, but they, they were the, the Yamashita the general was totally cut off. You had to just fight the Americans with what you had. And the day we were released, some kids didn't know where to go. Well, Captain Kataoka and my uncle said, we'll take you to your grandmother's, and they called me a pro-Jap. And when I got, we, I went back to school. It's walking distance. And boy, some Filipinos beat me up. They called, <laughs> they said I was a pro-Japanese. No, they didn't know that Kataoka and his group were, they were not pro-Americans, they were soldiers, but they, they, were, they were helping. His last word says, he says, when he said, came to say goodbye, he said, your grandfather's alive. He was then in, the, in Los Baños camp, another camp. He was transferred, but he's very sick. He said, I cannot help him anymore, he said. He said, the Americans own everything, the skies, the seas, and I know we have no chance. He was crying. MacArthur landed October 20, 1944, that picture there, in Leyte. And that's why he knew that, that, that they had no chance. He said, and then fighter planes were flying all over, and Americans were bombing the Japanese. And the food situation was, the market, the Paco Castle School, there was a bridge and a huge Paco market. And uh, what the Jets would do is when the markets were allowed to open twice a week, and they would confiscate everything for the soldiers. So the Filipinos got smart. They put little things there. When, when, and there were lookouts, and the Japanese would leave We'd buy all what we can, but when you're white, you don't have to buy, they give it to you. The vendors would just load you up with what they could. Bananas, papayas, and salted fish. Oh, yes, uh, they called me Lee, you know. Come, 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 they put the bag in, and I'd run home and bring the food home. It was still hard. It was very, very bad times in 44. And all we heard is, I shall return, and you saw matches with MacArthur's face, and. That was illegal. They'd kill you if they find you with that. They'd, they'd torture the heck out of you. But this was all over. When the U.S. was bombing us already, they, they killed Judge de Leon's entire family. It was across the street with, with Jisikara, the Indian family that owned all the jewelry stores, and Mrs. Lily. And right next to them was de Leon. They, they, they killed them all day. The only thing I saw from the porch, because we were not in our house, we were here, and Delphine was, Delphine was Mrs. Lee's brother. Mamie, Mamie was calling uh, my mother, you know. She was released too. I'm tired, I'm tired. And then we heard shots and shots and shots and the girls uh, yelling. And the only thing we saw and we decided to come back to our house is when they threw the baby up and uh, bayoneted the baby. I saw that. There, there was a total order to massacre civilians. Yamashita, General Yamashita ordered the same thing MacArthur did, open city. He said, we will fight the Americans in the mountains. We will avoid bloodshed in Manila. It didn't work like that. He left with all his army and went to Ipo Dam and on up to waiting for the Americans, the second landing. And Admiral Iwaguchi of the Japanese Marine landed 16,000 Marines. And his order was to kill whoever they could kill. De La Salle College there, where my, 
uh, German scholars, one of the best, they put all the nuns and the civilians inside, inside the chapel and, and, and burned the chapel. Yeah, that's all over. But the book says of these atrocities, that the destruction of Manila and the massacre of 150,000 civilians was caused by, no, it's only 10% Japanese. How could 16,000 Japanese start killing civilians? 150,000, 90% were U.S. bombs. But you know what the Filipinos say? We didn't care. Senator Kahlo, but she, she was 20 years old. She said, we, I saw my, my parents, she said, bombed out, killed by American bombs, and all of us, they bombed. He said, but we didn't care. We were just so glad to see the Americans back. And when we saw those GIs, we didn't care who in our family was killed. We knew that it was over. We had the U.S. back on our side. The first two U.S. soldiers we saw, we, we were all, I mean, there was maggots and anywhere you saw was uh, dead bodies. After, on our side, you know, Manila's big. There was about two days of continuous bombing and I, I was singing and my maid was cooking rice and we were, whoa, 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 and shrapnel was going. I said, what the heck going? Then Benny, when it hit our house, I knew. You know, you get the thing gets so dusty. And I ran out, and there was a German lady, old lady, and her husband was putting the stomach back in. That's from another bow, another house, German Jews. And my grandmother started wiping me. She said, you're hit, you're hit, in Spanish. I said, I don't feel nothing. I was full of hair and little bones, you know. And when we looked in there, on the first floor, my cerebrum was like that with no head. And I was so close to her, everything got concentrated on me. And uh, it was... It's, over and over, dogs, cats, bodies, J Japanese troops. And then we saw, then it was silence, eerie silence, stink. And we heard our monkey in the yard making noise, you know. And there were four houses left in our district, four or five. The rest were nothing. And we looked up, we saw these two big guys, you know. <laughs> and, and I told my uncle, oh, they're white guys there said, well, they look like soldiers. And they were playing with the monkey. It was silence, you know. And then when they heard where we were, a bunch of civilians, they approached this way. Uh, we okay. units here. They approached <laughs> this way. With, and they started pointing their... And we were all shaking, you know. I said, this can't be Americans. Because when they left, they had the old British helmet. And when they came back, they had this Vietnam-like World War II helmet. And we thought they were Germans. And my uncle was kneeling down. He said, we're civilians, we're civilians, you know. There was no more shooting, a little pop here and there. And I saw on the pistol belt of the canteen U.S. I said, to, I told my uncle, you see that canteen? I said, you see the U.S. on the side? He looked up, he said, are you Americans? He said, yes, we're Americans. He said, we're, we're scouts. He said, please be quiet, you know. When they said they were Americans, the, the girls just got up to take, take off their shoes or kissing their feet. I'll never forget that. They were kissing them, oh man, crying. And they said, please, the, one, the other GI just was pulling away. This girl was kissing her feet and, and crying and, and, and so happy, you know. And he said, it'll be a couple of hours when you see the troops walk in. And sure enough, after two hours, they start tanks and the first cavalry. And I said, why are you wearing the Japanese flag on your shirt? He said, no, he said, we're from the 37th Ohio National Guard. And that's what you see there. I'm the only associate member. I couldn't be a member because I was not a soldier, but they made me a lifetime member. 1945, February. The entire month of February was the Battle for Manila. 1,100 GIs dead, 150,000 civilians, and uh, Practically all the Japans were killed. In my case, I saw eight GIs killed around, around our place, eight. When they took our house, I went with the 37-145 Infantry Headquarters Company as a mascot. They moved forwards toward the church, and I saw four GIs walking, you know, with their rifles, and the tanks were all stopped, and we heard a prrrr. I don't know whether they died, but they fell. And one, one GI was pulling the other by the boot, you know, pulling them back underneath the tank. But unlike Vietnam, American soldiers didn't yell and shout. There, there was so every time there was a problem, everything was quiet. 
and they're trying to figure out where the, the machine gun fire was coming from. And they were talking in radios, and boy, I was listening everywhere. Wah, 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 wah. And then you see the tanks turn around like that, they're turrets, and they fired at the church steeple, and it blasted that steeple. My church, where I had my first one. And the, there are two big crosses, cast iron, huge. And do you know that one of them fell straight down and they left it like that? I don't know if it's still there, but they left it straight in the ground. The ball just sunk in the ground. That night, about three days, they said they were moving on. And I said, I want to go. Sar Staff Sergeant Frank Alexic and Sal Mangano and Joe Palladino was there. And he said, you can't come with us. And then I said, I want to go. You know, they had a jeep and a machine gun in between. The jeep was parked in front of the house, and and they looked at each other and said, we'll come back for you this evening. I said, I don't believe you. I said, and uh, he took off, they took off their, both of them, their watch and their dog tags and their wallet, and one of the helmets, they put it there. He said, we'll be back for you. They decided to, to well, I believed them then because I had all their money. Now, I don't know how much was in there. And they came back towards sunset, and they had a, they found me uniform from the Women's Army Corps. None would fit me for the regular size. They took it from the girls, from the Red Cross. And so I was wearing a, I resented that. And they had women's boots too, fit me, you know. But I wore it. And that, that was bad because we went on to this De La Salle College where they massacred those people. And we were just sitting on the, everything was burning down. We were sitting on, I mean, hundreds and thousands of troops a few blocks from this college, you know, and uh, there was continuous shelling. They were, they, they were still bombing that after being burned. And when the troops got up to go, somebody handed me a carbine M1. I could hear them all. In the evening, he said, shall we, be, shall we give the kid a weapon? Shall we give the kid a weapon? Another guy said, I'll give him a weapon. And boom, I had a carbine. And we moved into the uh, Rizal Coliseum. Oh, man. I saw those tanks there. It was a baseball park. That's built by the U.S. government. Huge, bigger than what you got here. They tore down the, the tanks, rammed the, the walls, and got in the baseball park, and there was fire. I was, the infantry was behind. It was the tanks that went in. But then after the tanks moved a little bit, we moved in. I got cut here, right here. Because when we got to the railing, you know, the bleachers, they were metal that was hit by shrapnel that were up like that. And then there was machine gun fire, and somebody took me and tried to put me down. And this was all cut. Half of my finger was cut here. And then that's when they took me back. And then I went with them again on another battle, Ipo Dam. That's 50, the water reservoir. That was bad. The, the Japanese didn't destroy the buck. They just put all the priests and nuns in the in the chapel and some refugees that were in there and they, they burned them in there. They shot them first and burned them. Well, I, I didn't know this. I knew afterwards. But we were right outside. They were probably rotting in there already. When the U.S. mortars were shelling that same, they were shelling that same college. But that's after these people have been massacred already. But there was massacre everywhere, everywhere. There were, girls were being raped, and they bayonet them after raping them. And the Filipina young kids, because Iwaguchi's order was to to destroy any Filipino because they're pro-American. But they can they couldn't do much. It was the bombs that that, and there was no way for America not to get in there without clearing it out. And still, they had a lot of casualties. Yeah. So we were we, were, my aunt lives in that district. Uh, uh, that's a ritzy bitsy, the rich people there, not us, but, and I could see the slew of mortar emplacement just poom, 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 they would just clear out, then they move on. And then the, when they, they mortar what they were, they want to move on, they stop mortar and the troops move in. And then they move the mortars forward again, fast, I mean, like that. And it was later that I read, in fact, I, you can have copies of it there. Uh, some of the German pre priests got out, but they died later. They were very badly wounded. They massacred them. And they took the baseball field. 
we went back to the house, to my house, and there was a little bit, of maybe one day R and R, not R and R. They just had some time off, and then they were told. We, Manila was practically taken, secure, not totally, but when they call it secure, so that's it. And they had to move outside Marikina Hills. The one thirty-seven moved. They were moving north to push the Japanese out. That's when they encountered those same Japanese that cleared the city, Yamashita, General Yamashita and Kataoka, they were there in that hill. I didn't see them, but I didn't know I was going there, but they put me on a jeep, and when we got to the combat zone, they covered me with canvas in the back, because they're not allowed to take kids there, but the combat MPs wouldn't, wouldn't let them, but they said, keep quiet, they were, and we went into this battle zone. It was quiet, quiet, you wouldn't believe. It was dark, but the next day when I opened my eyes, there was, hundreds and hundreds of 105s and 155s facing those hills. First the planes came, boom, boom, there was nothing left. And then the 105 started, oh, oh. Just, they shoot like this, boom, 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 boom. And the next row go, boom, 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 boom. And then they stopped that and the troops moved in, I moved in. And that's where I first experienced the worst thing in my life is I saw a, a mortar emplacement with about six Japanese soldiers. I, I think they were dead, but one was alive. He was wounded. He, and this Danny Sheen, staff sergeant, he was, they were going crazy already. He took my, the, not, not the barrel of my weapon and he cocked it and he pushed it toward the face of this Japanese soldier. He was just like that. And he said, you fired that thing, son. And they put a 45 in my head. He, he was, he wouldn't have done it, but he said, if you don't fire, he said, I'll, I'll fire. So I fired two times. I fired this way. And then I, something happened. I, they said, we better take him back home. And Danny Sheen was badly, he was a big burly guy, 37 division. He, a week later, escaped from a military hospital, wounded came to our house and we didn't know what to do with him. He said, he said to my grandmother, don't send me back, I want to stay here. Said, what will you do with a wounded soldier in a house that even has no food? So we decided to, my uncle said, call the combat MPs. He said, we have a wounded soldier in our house. He's, he escaped from the hospital. He was, side was shot up. The same guy who put the nozzle and then Weeks later, a month later, he came back in his khakis. He said they were sending him home. He, the GIs at that point, after two years in Guadalcanal, seeing their buddies killed, they didn't want to take no prisoners. There were, a lot of them were going. General Beetler, the commander of the battle for Manila, said these words, I will kill a million civilians and damage this whole city to save one of my soldiers. He said that when he was 90 years old, the British press interviewed me, he's dead. I have his picture. He said, you remember saying that? He says, yes, I do. He said, would you say that now? He said, no, I won't, he said. But if you've been through what we've been through, maybe you'd say anything, he said. He didn't mean that, you know, but he would, they were mad. They were ready to see all two years of battle in the jungles and then seeing all those I seen one, John Little John, his stomach was, no, his leg. Yeah, I had him in Ipo Dam, yeah, that's it. I sat down, I didn't know, I start, that's the only time I cried. I never cried before. That's the time they decided to send me back. I put, I sat down with him. He was, you know, just shattered. He took off his watch, his wallet, his eyeglasses. And he gave it to me. He gave me all this little money he had. And he took his dog tags. He was shaking and gave them to me. But when the jeep came with the litters to pick him up, they took the dog tags away. They let me have everything else. They had to take the dog tag. I tried to trade. I know the, the last name was Little John from North Carolina, 145th Infantry. We were moving in. There were some GIs hurt. And uh, when I looked at him, and I knew him from headquarters company, I, I, I just sat down, and I, I think I, I put his head on me, and, and he just started taking out all his stuff. Maybe, maybe a shot, maybe a mortar shell, maybe a step on something. 
I did see it happen. I saw him that way. But they were very fast. They, they have jeeps with four liters, medics. Uh, and the one driving that was Donald Roberts of Akron, Ohio. I saw him here again in 1955. They came in and they took him and said, sorry kids, they have to take the dog tags. And then I heard Frank Alexiak said, we're going to have to take this kid home. He said, no. I, I was, the bombs didn't hurt me, the war didn't hurt me, that, that did it. That, I just couldn't take it. Um, and they went on north and uh, Japan surrendered September 4th. The, the 37th disbanded in San Francisco December of that same year. They, they ceased to be, now they're on, but they're, they're called a, not a division. Papa was released from the hospital three months after the liberation, we call it. He came back home and, and GIs jacked up the house and tried to pry it up. We had a grand piano in there. And, to, and the 37 was fighting on and school started to open, but you know the concrete structure of, of a single story building like the classrooms, they were concrete with the, uh, American forces, uh, then came the Red Apple, the, the, they call it the, the occupation forces, regular army, to occupy, they don't fight. They came in, the 618 ordinance, uh, they, they put canvas for the roof, any way they could. They put lumber and all the GIs who put canvas. It was maybe through my influence. I called the GIs, said, we got to fix my classroom. And the Belgian nuns would, would, you know, make coffee and coffee that come from them. They used to give us cans and, but uh, the, the, they, they were there in the evenings, the regular army, and they started uh, fixing, well, not, not fixing, not, not repair, just temporary repairs so we'd have a roof. And the desks, we had no desks, they were burned. So we sat anywhere, but we had classes. Started to, started to revamp like that. Even into 46, I didn't even live at home. I lived with a 680 in the ordinance. There's a big, massive uh, public school that turned into a machine shop, and the war in Okinawa and Iwo Jima was still going on. And they brought in weapons there, uh, the 155s, they call it 618 OBAM. It means uh, Ordnance Based Armament Maintenance. Okay. And under them, they have a 3626 recoil repair company. Those weapons, those cannons have springs. They have to change the springs. I learned to do that. Now, I saw them and I helped. I had to grease the springs out of the boxes. And those springs from the recoil, they have to replace them. And they have lines of them. We brought them in trucks. And they grease them and send them back maybe for Japan. Maybe they're getting ready for the invasion. And there's just a massive operation. It's not just the infantry. It's with support services. It was, uh, I learned a lot. I learned to use the late machine at 12, and uh, they taught me a lot. And, and in fact, it's uh, Jack Youngs of the 3626 from Milford, Connecticut. He paid for my college. He sent me money every, you know what $50 a month was then? Big money. He wanted to sue my mother to adopt me, but that didn't work. He said that, my, that we are, we're incapable of uh, my, my People were incapable of uh, supporting us. Where, how do you expect after three years of war? Well, he was okay. And when I visited him in Milford, I stayed a week in his house. He and his wife had no children. And I was going to take the train back to Baltimore. They took me to a car lot and gave me a brand new Nash Rambler, the two-seater one <laughs> with a ribbon. She put a ribbon. He said, can you drive? Yeah, I said, I was already an engineer, 22. He said, well, that's yours, man. He said, take it. They gave me a brand new car. It was four, brand new, $1,400 then. Wow. A Ford was $1,800, the cheap Ford. We'd been back and forth in the United States prior, prior, prior to World War II. As a kid, we came for vacation. But uh, in 1955, I'd been at sea, 56, I'd been at sea as a, I went in as a apprentice and, and stayed Two fifty-six, on in the Merchant Marine. I was already third assistant engineer. I got to San Francisco. I was a four, third assistant on a big cargo ship, and we were bound for Cape Town. And I called my dad in uh, in Baltimore. I says, Dad, I says, uh, 
I'm here in Long Beach, he said. And uh, he said, I'll send you a plane ticket, come over. I said goodbye to the captain and the chief engineer. And I'm not, I wasn't supposed to do that, but my grandfather paid the bond, see? Because they knew that if I got to the States, I'd never, I'd leave. I left the ship. And I flew TWA propeller to Baltimore. And I remember that Coke was 10 cents. And, and right that year, I married uh, my first wife, Mineko, a Japanese-American. She just called me there. She's 72. Nice. Yeah, they said that she was high class. I couldn't get her. I got I married her. <laughs> <laughs> and our son was made major. He don't like me. Huh? And then I, we were divorced. We were friends. She just called 9 o'clock the day before yesterday. She's 72. Mm -hmm. She remarried. And my son made major, and then and I remarried in 62 to Lucille Phelps of Annapolis. And she died of melanoma in 65. I have a daughter with her. She was a student nurse. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we, we, she was a very good girl. And I, could, I wasn't here when she died. I was in Vietnam. And I was coming back and said, no, no, no use, you know. And, she, and our daughter was one year old, I think. I saw her last year. Um, after that, I Vietnam phased out. Another, another, not good Vietnam. Sh I was project engineer there for the Navy in Camran. We were under the Coast Guard. Merchant Marine is civilian ships. But there I was kind of a big boss. I was a port, port engineer. P-O-R-T, you're in charge of all the ships. Uh, we were under the Navy. We were under the command of the Navy. They had a lot of subcontractors. I had 18 tugs and desalination plants. And, and uh, then we organized an employment. Vietnam was facing out. And the Phillips Petroleum hired me. And I ended up in New Guinea. And I saw my wife. I, I came. I saw I conquered. I said, let's go to America. I'm rich. Yeah, this is where. I dare so. <laughs> but we need to convey to the young children of today what it was for, for, for some, some of, I think we're losing ground a little bit. I mean, uh, I see all these big SUVs and I get confused, man. I see cars at 30,000 and see, I drive old cars. I had a five bedroom house in Canada, so I built houses there. But this is the best thing that happened for a guy with Social Security. Yeah. My wife has an embroidery machine there, cash. My daughters are all scholars. I have a, we have a daughter now, University of Georgia, senior. The second one, IBM, and my other daughter made captain. Taking all the war aside, what molded my life into whatever it is today is the American soldier. The 37th Division. I, I'm obsessed with it. After the girls left the house and they're married and all that, I started looking for the 37th. I hadn't realized that there was an association. And no, nobody would listen to me. I'd call the National Guard there. Then finally I get in my recording a sergeant something, George. I have his name, a black kid, staff sergeant. He said, sir, I've been getting your messages. I'm with the Ohio National Guard. And the reason I didn't answer is because I didn't know what to say, but I made some research. And the recent association, 37th Division, all the wives are still there. And, and this Colonel Sadlako called me, and they printed my story in there, and they, they found some wives that remember my name, and a couple visited me here. And I made contact in 2005, 2005, that's a long time. It gives me the goose pimple, but what molded what molded me into what what my life is outside my profession is is uh, my pr principles come from from American soldiers before the war and during the war and after the war. And my daughter made captain with full scholarship. I was proud of that. I could write so many things about uh, the. It's a, it's a, I couldn't believe that this, this, there were sad looks in their faces when they, when they walked through on two sides of the street and I was watching them with a patch and then the jeeps and tanks and they were parked in front of our house and they had been in battle for two years in Guadalcanal. 
See, the 37 is a northern division, but when they got to the Philippines, there were all, all kinds of replacements. And mind you, it took, to go back to the Philippines, MacArthur's planning took a year in the island of Biak. And after the final meeting before the invasion, 800 ships, 300,000 soldiers to go back to the Philippines. His final words to his generals, he turned around and he said, gentlemen, when we land in the Philippines, I want to make sure them Georgia boys are with us. <laughs> they say they fight the best. <laughs> Respect your values and, and look into things before you jump and know what war is all about and why we're at war. Why are we in Iraq? A lot will disagree, but mind you, I know what's out there and I know we have to do something. Bush, I, I'm not totally, I'm a, I'm a Bush man. And I was in favor of Desert Storm. I was in favor of this war. It seems I'm leaning towards redeploying, not getting out. What would I tell the children is, is that song right there. What is America? I'll give you the words to that. It's very sad because when, when Lucy died, they gave my mother a box full of my tapes. And I was a Sinatra Dean Martin fan. And that's 1965. I came back in 80. Mom died in 2001, and that box came to me. I didn't even know what it was. In this little house, I had a five bedroom. I opened that box, and I pulled out this tape. I have to find it because I need the, the music to that. And when I played it, it was Sinatra's 50th birthday. The house I live in, the people in the street, the baker and the butcher. But those are last words. What is America to me? What a, it's the people, but most of all the people. I, I'm a total military man, although I, it's sad that we must die for liberty. We got hit with Pearl Harbor, we got hit with the World Trade Center, the Pentagon. They're out there for us, those boys. Liberty, liberty is something that the, the children today, very few learn to appreciate. But we who have experienced other than that, you know, I could, I could write many things about liberty. People don't understand America. America's it's got it all, and some people don't know that. Mm -hmm.